Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning, church. And that's the right appeal this morning because that's what we're going to talk about. The church. You know, the story goes of, uh, well, before I get into that, I have to tell you that I walked away from my job at noon yesterday. What does that mean? No, I didn't quit. Tim, you're smiling. I didn't quit. I said, it is so beautiful out. 85 degrees, and I, I got to tell this story. This is not part of the sermon. He said, Chuck, how do we fit this winter? It won't fit, so don't worry about it. My boss calls me up. He's a vice president of, of uh, global vice president of marketing. And uh, he said, what you doing? I said, well, I'm working on a project here. And I said, I'm looking across outside my window and looking at the golf course. And I said, boy, it is certainly tempting. And he said, well, I got to go out and golf. I said, well, you know, I got a boss that's a real joker. <laughs> He said, I'm the nicest guy you know. And he said, if it was me, I'd be out there golfing. So I just wanted to say, we, uh, it's wonderful to live in Arizona, is it not? And I will tell you, uh, I, I, wanted, I was going to ask George, why don't we just move the service out in the yard? And so wouldn't that have been nice, huh? Well, let's get to the sermon. story goes of a Christian elementary school who, in essence, was thinking of a way that they could do the, peach, uh, the parent teacher conference along with keeping the kids entertained at the same time. So they said, you know, we'll have a snack night. And uh, a snack night meant this, that after school was out, the kids would go down to the cafeteria and have a snack while the parents met with the teachers. So anyway, uh, that day came. It was school had just uh, closed, and the kids were down in the cafeteria and so forth. There was this long table. And at one end was a, a multi-baskets multi of apples. And at the other end was numerous boxes of chocolate chip cookies. And at the end with the apples, there was a little note. And it said, only take one. God is watching. And at the other end, there was no note. So a little fifth grade girl took a little pen out. And she started to scratch on a piece of paper. And she put on the the chocolate chip cookies. Take as many as you want. God is watching the apples. <laughs> you know, I'm glad we have a multitasking God. Are you agreeing with that? One who basically can run the universe and can count the hairs that are on your head. I can't even fathom that. And I'm a multitasking guy. So, this morning, I want to raise an issue for you that you may or may not be aware of. In certain circles, the Christian circles especially, at the universal church level, there are people who are somewhat doubting that God is in control. Because the fact is that the church is losing, losing its members in droves. And that is a fact. Why is there such a lack of interest in spiritual things? Well, I will tell you this. The Bible tells us that Jesus gave everything he could for the church. Everything. And we know that. So what's the issue? I'm going to give you some surveys this morning. You say, well, why would that be? Because I'm a consultant. I live off surveys. George knows what I'm talking about. So I'm going to give you a couple, and we'll kind of play with those a little bit. Let me warn you about surveys, however. Sometimes people who write surveys write the questions as such they get the answer they want rather than what the person wants. So you've got to be careful with surveys and so forth. And I'll go back to that a little later. In a survey that was conducted by the American Time Use Survey, and it was let out by an economist by the name of Michelle Freeman, and she's with the Bureau of Labor Statistics, she found out that millennials, now millennials are all over the place in age groups. Anybody want to guess what an age group is for a millennial? You guys don't qualify. <laughs> no. Eight, uh, some say 18 to 38. In this study, it's 23 to 38. How many 23 to 38s do we have here? Really? Uh, you excused. No. Uh, and so forth. So anyway, here's what it says. <coughs> While millennials are more highly educated and spend more time working with their counterparts, 
they have stop, stepped back dramatically from religious activities. <coughs> now, some of you who are in that age group, I wonder if you have noticed that. Now, many of you are Christian, and maybe those who you associate with don't fit that category. But you may have friends that do. There's another study which is put out by the Pew Research Center, and they do a lot of studies regarding religious issues. And it says here that there has been, it says, well, I'll just read the thing. It says, studies tracking American religious landscape found that although religious beliefs and practices have been declining at a rapid pace for all ages, so we're not just picking on millennials here, the drop-off has been pronounced among people ages 20 through to 28. In 2019, recent survey, roughly two-thirds attend worship service a few times a year or less, and four in ten say they never attend. Never. We might say, well, we gotta give millennials a break, will you? They're just starting out in life. They got a new job. You know, they got student loans to pay off. Uh, they, you know, we'll give them a break there. When they start having kids and so forth, things will change. And we have kind of this life cycle opinion or effect that when that happens, when they have families, they'll come back. Let me tell you something. Statistics today say that's not happening. In the past it has, but not now. And so we say, well, wait a minute, Brother Biggs, you're talking about the universal church. Does anybody know what we mean when we say the universal church? You know, there's two things. There's the universal church and there's church membership. They're two separate entities. The universal church is every individual who has accepted Jesus Christ as a personal savior from sin is part of the universal church. That includes Christians from all areas, from all different denominations. Church membership is another issue, and we'll talk about that later. But let's talk about Adventists. It couldn't be applied to us. Not us. During the 2018 Annual Council of the General Conference Executive Committee that was held in Battle Creek, Michigan, there was a man by the name of David Trim, who was the director of the Office of Archives, Statistics, and Research, and he presented a statistical report regarding what we're talking about this morning. And he says this, Amid the many numbers describing the reality of a growing church, Newsweek magazine, maybe it was a year ago, said that Seventh-day Adventists have one of the fastest growing churches in North America. They said, well, that's good. I, I can get into that. Basically, Mr. Trim says, of those we baptized in 2017, we lost 42% of them. That's not a good number. In 2017, we baptized, or I should say brought into church membership, either by baptism or through profession of faith, 1,352,931, that's worldwide, and we lost 563,205. What are the reasons? Well, the reason given at the general conference session was some were baptized, but they were not discipled. And they said that people tend to disappear when they're not consciously involved in the activities of the church, and that is a fact. Others are hurt by long-standing members and various opinions, interpersonal conflicts, whatever, and they leave. This morning, we're going to address the issue of the responsibilities of the church regarding new souls and attrition. And by I mean by attrition is keeping what we have. You know, in the business world, we ask the question, what's more important, having a new client or keeping what you have? What do you think? Former or latter, which one do you agree with? Is it better to have new clients, if you had just a choice, or keep what you have? Why? Good answer. To keep what you have, because when people leave, they have negative connotations of why they left, and they spread that around. They spread that gospel around. And people say, well, I don't want to go there. And so that's why attrition is an important issue for us. It's important in business and it's important in our church. 
So we're going to ask two questions today. Why should I be a member of the church? And number two, what should, what should I become as a member of the church? You know, financial advisors tell us that if you're going to invest money, you need to be diversified, right? I looked at the market the other day, and I'm diversified, but I'm losing money <laughs> because of some virus going around. Have you heard about that? Yeah, and so forth. But you know, when it comes to God's strategy for the church, it's not diversification that he's concerned about, it's concentration that he's concerned about. And that concentration is on Jesus himself. He is everything to the church. He is the church. Without him, it doesn't make any difference about the Sabbath. The state of the dead doesn't mean a thing. Coming to church every week doesn't mean anything if Jesus is not the center. And we're going to prove that today when we look at the early church and how the church was formed. Jesus said, if anyone comes after me... Let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. That's not a negative connotation that Jesus gives. That's a positive thing. Jesus says, my burden is light. My burden is easy. Unload yours and take mine. You know, the human body is an amazing thing. And I was looking at all the various things the human body does, and I don't have all week to do this, and neither do you, so I'm going to skip you a few. A heart beats 100,000 times a day. Let's see, 360 days in a year. I'm 75. I can't count that high. That's a lot of beats, isn't it? Number two, our lungs inhale over 2,000 liters of air every day. And our brain is more complex than most computers because we have over 100 billion nerve cells. Now, I'm impressed with the body, but I'm more impressed about something else. And I'm going to tell you this story. Many, many years ago, I was to meet a pathologist in one of the resorts downtown, and I was working with him on a couple of projects. You know what I'm talking about here? Yeah, okay. Anyway, he, uh, he was late. He was coming in from San Francisco. The guy's older than I am. Somebody says, that's not possible. But, oh, he was. He was like 78. Dr. Hubert, I wanted to make sure I clarified that, okay? So, anyway, he was 78 years old. He comes running through the airport. It's 9.30 at night. I'm sitting in the lobby, and he says, are you Chuck Biggs? I said, yeah. He said, go get me a, a, a table at the restaurant. I haven't eaten yet. I said, Fine. So I, uh, I'm in the restaurant, in about 15 minutes, he comes running, he sits down, and he orders his normal dinner, two hot dogs and a bowl of ice cream. And uh, I said, are you going to have something else? Oh, no, no, this is good, and so forth. And uh, I found out later that he never could pass a hot dog stand. And if you're in Chicago, they're all over, aren't they? And so forth. The guy's 103 today. He goes, an, he goes annually to our African safari. And uh, same guy. It's amazing to me how we can abuse the body and it continues to struggle to function. You know, I lived in an age back in the 50s. My parents were not Christian people. Everybody smoked. Except for the women. And back in those days, it was not considered... Feminine to smoke. That's when it counts to be feminine, wouldn't you say? But they all smoked. And it's amazing. My dad included. My dad has a better program than the five-day stop smoking plan, however. One day he had burned himself on his hand. He came running into the hospital. He had a cigarette in his mouth. And he ran smack into the door, the glass door. He swallowed the cigarette and he didn't smoke after that. So that's another approach to the five-day program. I don't know if I would try that or not, but anyway, but the body is amazing, is it not? But there is another body that's even more amazing, and that's the body of Christ. And who's the body of Christ? It's you and me. Not a building, it's people. And that body lasts a long time. It lasts for eternity. Isn't that true? And so, Paul tells us in Romans 12, verse 5, 
He says, so in Christ, we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to the other. I want you to capture that thought, because we'll come back to it. Now, if we were doing a survey, here we go, back to the surveys again. If you were to sit down and ask somebody, why are you a church member? Zach, maybe, are you, maybe you should, no, nah, the kids may not be able to answer that one. I don't know. Who else is here from the academy? I'd like to have us, George, you, you know, you work around a lot of different people. Maybe you could ask, do a little survey on your own and ask them, what does it mean to be a church member? I'd like to know that. Some people would say, well, it's because it's a place we play tithes and offerings with our treasure. Where is Kelly Sue? Now, I brought it up, so there you go, all right? Some people think it's a place to develop a good lifestyle. Some people say, well, you have your name on the books and you're a member. And the list goes on, and the list goes on. The Bible points out a very different picture about what church membership is all about. The Bible compares church membership to an organ that's inside a body. And it's connected. And as long as it's connected, the body functions and performs. Take that organ outside of the body, and ultimately it dies. And the body suffers. And so, did the early church have that problem? Yes, they did. If you've ever taken the time to study the book of Hebrews, which is not really an epistle, Hebrews was a sermon. And Paul, in that book, talks about a problem in the early church. Not every organ was inside the body. In fact, these members began to make church, like maybe we do today, one of many options for which to use our talents, our time, and our treasures. Are we not tempted to use that? Not just young people, adults. We're tempted to use those things on other things rather than for God's work. And Paul had that issue too. Let's read our text again that George read this morning. It says, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. I want to come back to that. That is the most critical statement that Paul makes. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess. For he who promised is faithful. Who's the emphasis on? The emphasis of faith is not on you. The emphasis on faith is on Christ. To believe what he said is true and it applies to you. Now I'll come back to that. And let us consider how we may spur one another toward love and good deeds. The church helps us to do that. Not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. That is a dangerous game to play. The church was here for a reason. It was instituted by Christ himself. To avoid it is dangerous. But he says... Encouraging one another, all the more as you see the day of coming. I have heard it all when it comes to preparing for Jesus' coming. Oh, we hear about the 144,000. We hear about this. We hear about that. We hear about perfection. This is how you prepare for Jesus' coming. Be in church. Encourage one another. Grow in love and grace. That's preparation. That's what it means to be ready for Jesus. The church is a hospital. Don't ever get the idea that when you walk into a hospital, all you'll see is well people. I walked into the bay with it. I didn't see any. Well, maybe the guy was doing the greeting. Sick people there. When you come into church, don't expect perfect people. They're not here. They are people who said, I'm a sinner and I need help. Based upon that, how many of us need to be here? We all do, right? That's what the church is all about. It is a gift to us that God has given us. And so, the first question, why should I be a member of the church? Every time the word church, or almost every time is used in the Bible, it refers to a local, visible, single congregation where a group is responsible for a certain area. And 
the Christian who is not a member of that church is like an organ outside of the body. It's like a sheep without the flock. It's like a child without his family. God knows that we grow better together than we do by ourselves. Do you agree with that? But apparently many don't. It's hard to fathom. It's hard to understand. In the Living Bible, Ephesians chapter 2.19, boy, does this size it up. I want to tell you something, because it's on my heart all the time. Don't let anybody tell you that today that we have modern translations is not a blessing from God. I will tell you we have no excuse for not understanding the truth. There are, I don't know how many translations. Most of those translations are excellent translations. They are very good. You know, one day my father, as I said, he was not an educated man. He had trouble reading and so forth. He gave his life to Jesus. Isn't that wonderful? So did my mom. So did two or three of my sisters. We came first, and they came along. And so dad wanted to read his Bible, and he picked up a King James Bible, and do not take this out of context. He could not understand a word it said. You know why? Because it wasn't written in his language. It was written in the Anglo-Saxon. The, the, the devil, in essence, one way he can keep the truth out of people's hands is give them a translation they don't understand. Don't ever encourage people to read one or two different Bibles because you like it. Give them a Bible that they can understand. Do you agree? All right. And so anyway, I gave him the New International Version. We had one guy, I was preaching up in Payson, and I told you this. And he said, Brother Biggs, were you preaching out of a, another translation other than the King James? I said, well, yes, it's the NIV. Well, I don't know if you should do that. I said, don't worry, brother, it's a non-inspired version. He said, oh, that's okay. It's all right. And so forth. So we should be thankful that we live in an age that we can get us a Bible that we can understand. And we should have amens on that. It is a tremendous thing in our age. And so anyway, Ephesians 2.19, taken from the Living Bible, it says this. You belong in God's household with every other Christian. What do you think? Is that a good translation? It certainly is. It certainly is. Why do we need to be in the the house with other Christians. It's not only because the church needs us. It's because we need the church. I'm, I'm looking at Kim here a minute, and I was talking to Jim. Oh, we miss Jim. I want you to know that, Kim. Our class misses him. Our church misses him. We pray for him all the time. But Jim was sitting out in the car. You maybe remember this. And Kim says, why don't you go out and talk to him? Now, I don't think Jim wanted to come in. He'd had that week of chemo and so forth, and he was somewhat weak. So I went out and I talked to him. He came in, okay? And after church, I went up to him, and he said, you know, Chuck, I'm glad I came. That's what church does for us. Jim felt he was encouraged. He drew strength from you as members. That's what church is all about. That's what it means to really fellowship. When I was dating Carol, um, I was not the kind of guy that really wanted to go to church when we started dating. I said, you've you got to be kidding, right? Uh, and so forth. And, but if I wanted to be with her, Zach, I had to go where she goes. You know the feeling. Yeah. And so anyway, uh, we went to Youth for Christ. I told a friend that, and he thought I was kidding. That's how it was looked at then. And then we, Sunday, we had to go to church, too. She was not an Adventist. She was a member of the Evangelical United Brethren Church, comparable to the Nazarenes, if you're familiar with them. And I thought, I do not want to sit in Sunday school class with a bunch of Christian kids. How bad is that? So I got in there, and you know what? Some of my best friends came out of that class. These guys and gals treated me beyond understanding. They were relaxed. They weren't too caught up in what you shouldn't do and what you should do. But when we got together, I kind of got the feel. I felt comfortable in the midst. You know, sometimes as fellow Christians, we feel uncomfortable with others because we're afraid somebody's going to make a judgment on something we do. You cannot have fellowship with an atmosphere of judgment. Do you agree? And so... 
I had many friends from that group. I'm thankful for my wife who had insight of which I did not, and so forth. And it's been a blessing ever since. You know, there are great benefits to being a Christian. We're going to mention very quickly five or six of those. The text that George read, uh, read to us this morning in Hebrews basically says this, loving others and doing for others and encouraging one another. There are even more benefits. You know, George Knight, I love George Knight, and I'm going to read everything he says, but he makes a statement. And while corporate support is important, he's talking about the church, while it is important, it's crucial in periods of crisis and persecution. The church is going to be one of our defense mechanisms when we go through the time of trouble. We're going to need all the encouragement we can get. We're going to need all the strength that we can receive from our members, and Jesus will bless us. That's where he wants us to be. What are some of the other benefits? Physical benefits. Well, if you're an Adventist, you say, well, that's, that's pretty easy to understand. But going beyond even our health message, what are the physical benefits? Indiana Purdue University published in the Journal of Scientific Study of Religion that people who join a church and attend regularly get involved in the activities of the church, get sick much less often. It was found that non-church members who never attended church or rarely participated in church activities were more than twice as likely to report health problems. When God said, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together, he knew what he was talking about. I read an article the other day. It hasn't exactly been more than another day, a few weeks ago. I don't know how scientific it is. And I don't know how much truth there is in that, but I was pressed by it. So I'm just going to read this to you. It says, do not ride in automobiles because they cause 20% of all accidents. Do not stay at home because 17% of all accidents happen at home. Don't walk on the streets or the sidewalk because 14% of all accidents are do, happen to pedestrians. Do not travel by air, uh -oh, rail or water because 16% of all accidents happen to people who travel using those modes of transportation. But here's the real statistic. Only 0.001% of all deaths occur in the worship service. And ones that do, it's because of a previous illness. Come to church, it may save your life. We should put that in the, uh, yeah, okay. I think that might be good. And then there are emotional benefits. There are emotional benefits to being a church member. There's another survey. You're going to have to be tired of surveys we're done today. You're going to say no more surveys for a week. The Connecticut Mutual Life Insurance Company studied people who had joined a church, were actively involved, prayed daily, read their Bibles diligently and daily, and surrendered their lives to Christ. And when they compared these people to people in America who did not attend church or who were not religious, they discovered four things. Ready? Number one, church attenders are twice as likely to say their home life is happy. I didn't say that. That's what the survey says. Two, church attenders are almost twice as likely to believe that their work contributes to society. Think about that one. Number three, church attenders are more than twice as likely to reconcile marital problems rather than divorce. I've seen that too. Number four, church attenders are six times more likely to volunteer for community work. Does that surprise anybody? And lastly, and just as important, if not more so, is that the church provides spiritual benefits. When you become a member of the church, remember they said there's a difference becoming part of the family of God and become a member in the church. The Bible says, we'll say it again, that all those who accepted his accepted him and his, believed in his name, 
they had the right to become children of God. Not a member of a church yet, but they are in the family of God. Let us be very careful how we criticize our other Christians outside of these doors. Some of them are doing a very, very good work. Number two, and I'll come back to a believer because there's more to that, the church gives us identity. Basically what it should mean is when your name is on the books, you are a saved Christian person. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That should be all of us. That should be all of us. You know, I, when Carol and I were first baptized at the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Eugene, Oregon, uh, I'm somewhat a little embarrassing because uh, Carol went under, and when I did, my feet went straight up. And I looked like I was standing on my head. I remember that. Uh, there was more, much more to that baptism than that, but I remember that. Because Pastor reminded me that a couple of times. But anyway, we were so excited. We wanted to give Bible studies. We wanted to share everything. We and I didn't know a lot. And one day, it was about four weeks later, a member came up to me, and we were talking. He said, well, Chuck, he said, you guys are really excited about this, aren't you? I said, we are. He says, give it time. It'll pass. A member said that. Give it time. It'll pass. I don't know if he knew what he was saying or meant what he said but it had an effect on me. The church provides a maturity. You know, we talk about sanctification. We don't talk enough about it. People think sanctification means I'm working toward perfection. Nothing farther from the truth. Sanctification is not about what you're working for, but who you're trying to get to know. We talked about that in Sabbath school. You cannot trust Jesus unless you experience him in your life. I can't rely on Zach's experience. I can't rely on your experience. I have to rely on what God has done for me. That's the only thing that's going to make my membership worthwhile. And in the church, we have the opportunity to share with one another the good, the bad, the difficult, and we can grow together. That's the best way. When Jesus sent his disciples out two by two, why do you think he did that? For support with one another. Ministry. Ministry in the church meaning this. It gives you a chance to identify what your spiritual gifts are so that you can apply them to the church. Jesus said, I save you first. You're in the kingdom before you even get started. Why? Because you need to know that before you can do the work I need you to do. Do you agree with that? You need to be saved before you can do the work of salvation. Too many times, and I'm sure it happens outside of Adventism too. In fact, I know it does. The people are constantly bringing up, am I going to be ready? And am I going to be saved? Some people go crazy over that. Some leave the church over that. There's no reason to go through that. None. Have you ever given somebody a gift and they said, forget it? How do you feel? Not too good. Maybe I'll pay you back. Many times we give gifts knowing somebody gives us a gift. We know that we're giving them a gift. Why? Because they gave us one. Come on. Right? And it's the way we think, but that's not the way God intends it. You take what he gives you and you take it in boldly. And he's happy about that. And lastly, the church provides accountability. Do we need accountability? How many think? Do we need accountability? We're not real good on it ourselves, but the church helps us to have accountability. We belong to a small group that we go on Friday. We can't always make Wednesday prayer meeting. So we made a decision. We need to get with a small group so we can have that weekly prayer session. So we do it on Friday night. Now, if you have children, that might be a problem because you should be with your children on Sabbath evening. Would you agree? They need you. So you may have to do it another night. Maybe it's prayer meeting will be your small group. Maybe it's Sabbath school. Don't get me started. Maybe it's Sabbath school. You know the wonderful thing about small groups? Is that hopefully the leader does not give a dissertation on the subject. 
is that he opens up with questions so people can interrelate with one another, taking the principles of the lesson and applying it to their life. And we can talk about it back and forth. All of a sudden, we, there's that unity, okay? And we're keeping an eye on these people. What if they go astray? Maybe they got something involved. It's not that you're just church members or special friends of the church. You're a friend. And they're looking out for you, and we're looking out for them. I really believe in my heart that if we did more special groups and studied together, the church service is fine, but it's a one-way conversation. The best things you'll ever learn are in Sabbath school or in small groups. should make it a priority to make it an issue because they made it an issue in the early church. We can protect one another. Don't we want to do that? Don't we want our brothers and sisters, I don't care if what they fall into, we want them to stay attached to the Lord Jesus. Isn't that right? And so, the next question and last is what should I become as a member of the church? Acts 2, verses 41 and 42, and verse 46 outlines very well how the church was founded. It says this. Those who believed, that's the first part. Those who believed, that's the kicker, that's the starter, were baptized and added to the church. They joined with other believers and committed themselves to the apostles' teaching. They were in the word. I love the text. The Bereans were more noble than the members of Thessalonica because they studied the word daily, and to see if what Paul said was true. And you say, oh, that's heresy. Somebody said, well, I read a statement in Ellen White. I said, I checked it with Scripture. What? You, what? You wouldn't do that. Oh, yes, I would. I don't trust anything outside of Scripture. That's true Protestantism. I check everything with Scripture. You know, Ellen White herself said, all she keeps saying, get Back to the scriptures. So I'm going to ask you, what should you be studying? The scriptures. Any prophet that doesn't say that, and I can list you a number of them that came up around the time of Ellen White, never make reference to that. She is the only one. She's pointing us back to the wood. That's what our reformers were trying to do to get out of the tradition of the church and get into the Word of God. Don't that what we need? And that's our job as Seventh-day Adventists. We have a wonderful mission, a message for Christendom and those who are not saved. Well, anyway, it says, committed to the apostles' teaching. They worshiped together. And they met in homes. I believe that really could be translated. And they met as special or small groups. That was part of the description of being a member. Okay, very quickly. So, as a member of the church, they had the following. They believed. Let me tell you something. What is conversion? I don't know, you could take 50 minutes. I won't. Conversion is this. You take God at what he said he would do. Jesus came here, he died on the cross, and he was resurrected. You've heard that so many times, you can't count. But when you apply it to yourself... It has meaning. He died so that you could have life. Jesus knew what sin is. We don't. We think we do. So when you ask, what is sin? Well, it's a transgression of God's law. It's much more than that. It's much more than that. Sin is inbred in our being. It is so large, we can't put our hands around it. When Paul said, the things I want to do, I don't do. And he talks about the difficulty of sin in people's lives. And Jesus said, I want to tell you something right now. If you receive the gift I'm going to give you, if you accept that gift that I came so that you could have eternal life, so that you could be righteous in God's sight, would you take it? Believers say, yes, I'll grab it. But more than that, they say, you know, Lord, if you can save me, I want you to be Lord of my life as well. Now, I may have trouble keeping that one, but Jesus knew that, so he says this. That when we repent, as it says in Acts, and, and are baptized, we will receive the gift of what? The Holy Spirit, because you're, unfortunately when you and I are converted, our carnal nature is still here. Did you ever find out five minutes after you were baptized? 
the old self is still around knocking on the door. And Jesus said, I know that. I know that's going to be an issue for you, so I'm going to give you the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then he goes on to say that you have the right to become a family, be in the family. You have a right. You are authorized. And don't let people tell you otherwise. So when you look at the judgments of Daniel 7 and 8, that's a pleasant time because there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You will stand having the righteousness of Christ even though you're not. The idea of perfection before we are saved is wrong. Or after we're saved, I should say. The time that we'll ever get to a point in this life where sin will not be present is absolutely incorrect. Anybody that says that we have not sinned is a liar, the Bible says. We need Christ. We need His church to grow and mature. That's what we need to focus on. And so they believed they were baptized, which is basically representative of what we just talked about. They joined the church family. They committed to regular worship, and they connected to a small group. There you go. That's what it means to be a member of the church. What is the difference between then and now? The difference is that we are committed to Christ and then we're committed to the church. When we're committed to Christ, we're committed to Him foremost and foremost. But also it means that you're committed to other members. Each one of our members we now have responsibility for. That's what it means. And vice versa. And, you know, commitment is a bad word today. But God can help us to have commitment. My dad uh, told me one time, I always like to talk about my dad. My dad was not a Christian man until he was in his late 50s. Is that right, Carol? And uh, I worked with him since I was six years old. My dad was a custodian. Most of the time that I remember in my childhood that, it was, uh, that I, I remember the most was between the ages of six and ten. And uh, my dad worked at a uh, high school, one to grades one to 12, was out in the country. He was a custodian there. He did everything. And so at night, we'd come home, eat, and then we'd go back to the school, my older sister and I and my father. And I started that when I was six years old. He taught me how to drive a tractor at seven, and I mowed lawns, five and a half acres to do the lawns and all this kind of thing, tell you all kinds of stories. And one day, I came up to him, and I, it was another night we were working. I said, Dad, I don't any time to play. Well, that wasn't completely true. Close, but not completely. And he said, son, I need to tell you something. He said, you were born in this world to be a giver and not a taker. My dad had an eighth grade education, but he had a Ph.D. in common sense. And we could use a few of those today, wouldn't you agree? And so I'll tell you, the church is everything. It's not perfect, and sometimes people leave because it's not. But obviously all of us probably can take another look at what it means to be a church member. You see, if we're not a member, then we're a spectator. If we're a spectator, it means we're a consumer. If we're a member, it means we're a participant. There is a difference. In the early church, there were no, there were no individuals who were not, I should say there were no individuals who were spectators. None. And so, I'm going to finally read you a story. It's very short. And you may have heard this before, and it is kind of confusing, but I'll read it slow and see if we can pick it up. There are four people in this church, everybody, somebody, nobody, and anybody. How many have heard that? Good. All right. Short memories, or you've never heard it before. That's good. It said the church needed help meeting its financial obligations, and everybody was asked to participate. Everybody was sure that somebody would do it. Anybody could have done it, but do you know who did it? Nobody. It ended up that everybody blamed somebody when nobody did what anybody could have done. When the church needed some help with the children's department, somebody was asked to help. But somebody resented being called upon because anybody could have done it just as well. After all, it was really everybody's job. In the end, the work was given to nobody and nobody got it done. 
The process went on and on. And when the task that needed to be done, nobody could be talented on to do it. Nobody visited the sick. Nobody gave liberally. Nobody shared his faith. In short, nobody was a very faithful member. And so what does it mean to be a good church member? If I stopped here with this message, it would be ineffective at best. Because I've given you as I've received and all of us have received at time, pointers on what to do to be a good church member. But I want to take you back with this point. If you try to be a good church member by trying harder to do what I just told you, and you don't apply one very important principle, it will do you no good. And that's this. Do you remember what was the first thing that brought people to the church? They were believers before they were members. I will tell you right now, Jesus gives us a great example of how important it is that we're a believer before we're a member. And I'll give you two examples. Jesus and his disciples were invited over to the house of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Very close friends, as the scripture indicates. And Martha is one of those type A people. And... Uh, She's out in the kitchen getting everything going, right? And I think she's sincere. She wants to impress Jesus, wouldn't you? She wants to impress his disciples. She's out there slaving around. Where's Mary at? She goes in there, and Mary is sitting at the feet of Jesus. And she's saying, what's going on? I'm out here slaving away. She's going to eat what I produced. And she's ticked. She is a going-after-it member. She's going for it. And Mary's sitting around on the couch. And I, come on. So he comes out, she comes out and says, Lord, Lord, uh, get Mary to get up and get in the kitchen. We got things to do. Kind of like Zach's wife, right? Get in here. <laughs> no, she wouldn't do that. Yeah, well, she, you know, she's nodding. So anyway, here's the key. She said, Mary, or Martha, Martha, you worry about so many things. But there's only one thing that's important, and Mary is doing it. Now, I'm going to rephrase the question, and we're talking about how can I apply the things that we've learned with regard to church membership. A few honest Jewish people came to Jesus, and they had an excellent question that I wish I would have studied when I first became a believer. Lord, what must we do... What works must we do, works number one, that we might do the works of God? That's two and one. Now, I'm going to rephrase it based upon what we've talked about today. Lord, what work must I do that I might apply the principles of church membership? What they were saying is they looked at all those things we need to do and said, I can't do it. I've tried. I've done that. It just doesn't work. And here's Jesus' answer. The work that you must do, this is the work he's applied to all of us. This is where we need to put our efforts, is to know the one whom the Father has sent. And in John 17, 3, it says, by knowing Jesus, we have eternal life. That was his prayer. Oh, really? Remember, the first ingredient to be a member of the church is that you're a believer. So we need to know this. If someone was to ask you today, do you have a saving relationship with Jesus? Well, how would you answer that question? The first question is, I'm not good enough. I could be a better church member. I don't come to church very often. I don't, and they start going all the things why you couldn't be. We don't fall out of grace when we're not, when we're not exactly perfect. God works with us, and he's patient with his children. We look at the church of Corinth, and they were good. Oh, he... Paul called them saints. These people were doing all, they were suing other members. It was a church that needed a lot of help, like we do. We, we need to be able to answer that question. Is Jesus my Savior? Do I really believe that when the judgment comes, he'll stand for me? And I'll give you this news. If you can't answer that question, you go to him and accept what he's given you. Commit yourself to him and say, Lord, I'm gonna, uh, if you be with me and give me strength, work with me in my life, that I can be the Christian you want me to be. That's all God asks. 
Too many of us are trying to produce fruit, and not too many of us stay attached to the vine. What's more important? Jesus said, what you need to do is stay attached to the vine. What happens to the fruit? You will produce fruit automatically. That's what Jesus was saying. Change the inside, the outside will take care of itself. And so today, as I close, Jesus said you study the scriptures in order that you might have eternal life, but I tell you that the scriptures testify of me. Our faith is based on knowing Jesus. And perfection and anything else people want to talk about will take care of itself. We spend time in the Word. We spend time in prayer. Studying the Bible to know someone, which is the Lord Jesus, you will have the power to grow and, and live the life that God wants us to as long as we follow within a church setting. And so I say to you today, come to church. It might save your life.